Hello and welcome to this talk. The title is Project Panama, Say Goodbye to JNI. I'm Maurizio Cimadamore and I work for the Java Platform Group at Oracle. In the next 30 minutes, we are going to explore Project Panama. I'm going to tell you what Project Panama is about and hopefully demonstrate how Project Panama is going to help you accessing native libraries from Java code. This is a recorded session, so of course you can ask me questions directly but there is going to be a Q&A session running in parallel, which I will attend. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask and we'll try to do our best to answer. Panama is of course a forward looking feature and this talk is about an evolving API. As such, the contents of this API are subject to change. Please take some time to read through the statement in this slide. The landscape around Java application has changed quite dramatically in the last few years. Native libraries were something almost frowned upon in the Java community as there was a strong push toward writing everything in pure Java. Today, that's no longer the case. If you are a game developer and want to access the latest GPU features, or if you work in machine learning and you want to offload computation to the GPU, you need access to low-level features, which are typically not available in the Java programming language, nor in any of the supported Java APIs. In other words, you need to interact with some native library, which provides you access to such low-level capabilities. In this situation, the best thing that a language can do really is to make it easy for developers to access libraries written in another language. The Java Native Interface, or JNI, has been available nearly from day one and allows developers to reach into native libraries from Java code. It does so by allowing Java programs to declare native methods. In other words, methods whose implementation is not written in Java, but instead in C, C++, or even assembly. Using JNI is unfortunately very brittle and error prone, as you have to program in a strange mix of Java and C. There is also very little in the way of safety. JNI errors typically translate in J RJVM crashes. Native libraries never exist in isolation. Applications often need to exchange data with libraries, typically in the form of pointers to off heap memory. That is memory that resides outside the Java heap. The only supported API in the JDK to allocate and access off heap memory is the byte buffer API. While this is a good and mature API, it also has some limitations. For instance, off heap memory associated with a byte buffer cannot be released when the memory is no longer in use. Instead, off heap memory is free implicitly by the garbage collector when the buffer instance is no longer reachable. This is handy as developers don't need to worry about managing memory directly, but it can also create issues and tension if the off heap memory is not released in a timely fashion. Summing up, using native libraries from Java is painful in at least two different dimensions. First, JNI requires a lot of boilerplate code, which needs not only to be written, but also maintained and updated. Second, passing data to and from native libraries is hard and typically results in even more JNI code to be written. To switch to something more concrete, let's take a look at the TensorFlow C API. This is a sizable C API with several functions, structs, unions, and constants. All these program elements need some corresponding piece of JNI code so that a Java application can access them. In fact, if we look at the old TensorFlow Java repository, we will find that almost half of the code in there is not Java code, but JNI code written in C or C++. This creates an obvious maintenance problem. All this JNI code is difficult to review and secure and needs to be updated every time the TensorFlow library changes. Given all this, it is not a surprise that over the years, the Java ecosystem has come up with tools and framework to automate and even eliminate the generation of JNI code. The current version of the TensorFlow API no longer depends on JNI and is instead based on one of these frameworks. This leaves uh, Java developers in a bad place as they now have to choose between having to write and maintain lots and lots of C and C++ code or start depending on a third party framework, which may cause different maintenance and safety issues. Project Panama solves the problem of interacting with native libraries in three steps. 
First, it replaces the byte buffer API with a more modern and efficient API, which supports deterministic deallocation out of the box. Second, it replaces JNI with an API that allows developers to perform call to native functions directly in Java without intervening C or C++ code. Finally, Panama provides a new tool called JExtract to mechanically derive Java bindings from a set of native library headers. In other words, in the same way as the Panama Canal connects the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, Project Panama brings the world of foreign function and data closer to the JVM. Project Panama is not just about interacting with native libraries. The Vector API, also an incubating API in Java 18, is a new and powerful API to express SIMD computation directly from Java code. We won't have time to cover the Vector API today, but if you want to learn more about it, please refer to the information contained in JEP 417. This diagram recaps the architecture of the Panama Interop support. In the middle of the diagram, we find the JExtract tool, a tool which consumes native library headers on the left and generates low level Java bindings on the right. The bindings generated by JExtract sit on top of two important APIs provided by the Panama JDK the Foreign Memory Access API, which allows us to allocate and access off of memory, and the Foreign Linker API, which allows us to call foreign functions directly from Java code. The process described so far is entirely mechanical. We point the JStruct tool to some headers and we get some Java bindings back. These bindings are sufficiently expressive and can be used directly if you need quick access to a native library. Library developers may instead want to create an higher level library on top of the bindings generated by JExtract. While this is possible, creating a Java library is a creative process and some level of human intervention is required to inject uh, domain-specific knowledge into the mechanically generated bindings. Using JustRact is, of course, entirely optional. Maybe you are writing a framework that already has some uh, automated tool to generate the JNI bindings that you need. In this case, you can still benefit from Project Panama by replacing the JNI bindings generated by your tool with higher level bindings entirely written in Java. The Foreign Memory Access API is the first building block of the Panama Interop support. It provides a new, safe, and efficient API to allocate and access memory, whether on or off the Java heap. The main abstraction in the Foreign Memory Access API is called Memory Segment. A memory segment models a contiguous region of memory with some spatial and temporal bounds. In other words, a memory segment exists in space, so it has a base and a limit address, but it also exists in time because we can create, access, and then destroy a memory segment. In other words, a memory segment has a life cycle. Optionally, memory segments can be associated with threads so that access to segment can be thread confined. To the reference a memory segment, we have two options, which we'll, we'll cover in more details. The easiest option is to use one of the many reference methods provided by the memory segment class. Or we can describe the contents of a memory segment using a memory layout and then derive a varendal object from the layout. This varendal object can be used to dereference the memory segment. This option is more complex, but also much more powerful. Let's say that we want to allocate a struct of heap using the foreign memory access API. Here, point 2D is a C struct representing a point with two fields x and y of type double, which we want to assign to the value three and four respectively. To do that, we first need to create a new resource scope object. A resource scope is an abstraction that models the life cycle of memory segments. In this example, we create a new confined scope, and then we use this scope inside the try with resource block to allocate a new native segment. The size of the native segment is 16 bytes. That's the size of the point to destruct. Since the scope we created is confined, access to the memory segment will only be possible from the very thread that created the scope. To set the values of X and Y, we can use the setters provided by the memory segment class. For example, to set the X coordinate, we write 
the double value three at the offset zero in the memory segment. To set the y coordinate, we write another double value four, this time at offset eight. When the try with resource block is closed, the off-bit memory associated with the segment is released. This is very different from what happens with the byte buffer API. There is no need to wait for the garbage collector to determine that the memory segment instance is unreachable. Instead, the foreign memory access API allows clients to close a resource scope when it is no longer needed. We call this model explicit or deterministic deallocation, as opposed to the implicit deallocation model that is typically provided by the byte buffer API. In the previous example, we wanted to access the Y coordinate of a point struct. This is an example of what we call structured access, a very common operation when accessing off it memory. To perform structured access, uh, one option is to perform offset computation manually, as we did in the previous example. While this is possible, this is also tedious and error prone. If the layout of the point should be struct changes, a new coordinate is added, for example, or the type of the coordinate changes from double to float, some of the offsets and sizes in our program may become invalid and our program may no longer run. The memory layout API allows us to describe the contents of a memory segment programmatically. What I mean by this is that we can capture the layout of a point to distract in a piece of Java code. And then we can use this code to derive other important and useful information, such as field offsets, sizes, and even access expressions. To create a memory layout for a point 2D, we need to create a new struct layout. The struct layout is composed of two value layout components, one for each field of the point 2D struct. We can also attach name to the value layout components so that we can refer to them symbolically as X and Y. In this new example, we take advantage of the memory layout API to automate the computation of field offsets and sizes. The first thing we do here is to create a layout object for the point to distract with components X and Y. Then we derive access expressions in the form of random objects for the field X and Y. We can do that by providing a path from the struct layout down to the field that we want to access using the parendo. Inside the try with the source block, we see that the explicit offset and sizes are gone. Instead, the struct layout is passed directly to the segment factory. And the variables for X and Y are used to set the coordinates of the point to this struct. All this is possible without having to specify fields offset manually. As a result, this version of the code is much more robust than the one that we've seen before. The foreign linker API is the second building block of the Panama interop support. This API provides two basic capabilities. First, it allows method handles to target foreign functions. These method handles, called down call method handles, can be created and called only using Java code. Second, the foreign linker API can turn a Java method into a function pointer that we can then pass to a native function. This is very useful to implement callbacks. Interacting with a native function depends on a lot of low-level platform-dependent details, such as the size and the alignment of a function arguments and return values. These details determine how arguments and return values should be manipulated so that the native function call can work correctly. We use the term calling conventions to describe the set of platform-specific rules that native calls have to follow. In order to link a foreign function into a new method handle, the foreign linker API needs a description of the signature of the target foreign function so that the correct machine code can be generated. This is done by packaging memory layouts for the arguments and return values into a new abstraction called function descriptor. The support provided by the foreign linker API is very efficient. For down calls, that is called from Java to native, the foreign linker API is as fast as JNI, while for up calls, calls from native back to Java, the foreign linker API is three to four times faster compared to JNI. As we said, 
different platforms can feature different calling conventions. That is, different ways to pass arguments and return values across native function boundaries. In this example, we have a native function called distance that returns the distance of a point from the origin. This function takes a point to destruct and returns a double value. Inside the main function, we allocate a point to the on the stack. We assign the values three and four to the X and Y coordinates, and then we pass the struct to the distance function. Let's focus on the assembly code generated by the native C compiler for the main function. On Linux, instructions are generated so that the fields of the point to destructs are extracted and then stored into separate floating point register before calling the distance function. On Windows, the struct fields are instead spilled on the stack, and a pointer to the stack is moved into a machine register before calling the distance function. In other words, the same snippet of C code can give rise to very different core shapes, which implement the set of calling conventions supported by a given platform. Thankfully, when working with the foreign linked API, we only need to describe the layout of the argument generator value of the native function that we want to call and let the API take care of the low-level plumbing for us. This is how we call the distance function using the foreign linker API. First, we need to create a downcall method handle that points to the distance function. To do that, we need to obtain the address of the distance function. This is done here by using a symbol lookup object that can see addresses of all the native functions loaded by the current class loader. We can then create a down call method handle by passing the address of the distance function along with a function descriptor which describes the signature of the distance function. Here, the function descriptor takes a point layout and returns a double layout. Inside the tri-wither source, we allocate a memory segment as before, and then we set the x and y coordinates using the varendos as before. We then pass the memory segment directly as a parameter to the method handle invocation. In other words, the foreign linker API allows clients to pass memory segments to the uncall method handle directly. And it also guarantees that structs are always passed according to platform specific calling conventions. This is a big improvement over JNI, which has no first class support for passing structs directly to C code. While JNI allows us to pass by buffers to native methods, in this case, we will need some additional piece of JNI code to turn the byte buffer instance back to a point to destruct so that the distance function can then be called correctly. Any discussion on the foreign function calls will not be complete without some reference to safety. The foreign linker API is generally safer than JNI as it has less moving parts and native interop can be expressed entirely in Java. We also get first-class support for passing structs to native function, so there's less opportunity for mistakes. That said, linking a function into a downcall method handle is still unsafe. For instance, we could provide the wrong description of a native function by saying that the distance function takes two pointer struct instead of one. If we do that, the resulting downcall method handle will have an unspecified behavior. A native code is still free to access native memory as it pleases, even if the memory is associated with a memory segment that has already been freed. For this reason, access to unsafe operation in the Panama API requires explicit opt-in in the form of a new command line flag that can be used to grant specific modules access to unsafe operations. If access to an unsafe operation is detected in a module not listed in the command line flag, an exception will be thrown instead. In other words, an application can control which of its model can perform potentially unsafe operations. It is likely that in a future version of the GDK, access to JNI will be restricted in a very similar fashion. We have seen how to allocate uh, and access of it memory with memory segments, layouts, and varendos. And we have also seen how to create method handles targeting native functions. In other words, the foreign memory access API combined with the foreign linker API gives us all we need to interact with the native library. That said, it would be impractical to ask developers to manually write all the layouts, function descriptors, and varendol and method handle associated with a native library. 
Not only this process will be tedious, but it will also be error prone. Struct layouts, for instance, can contain platform specific details such as padding. Any mistake here could result again in unspecified behavior. Instead, Panama provides a tool called JStruct, which parses the header file associated with a native library and then generates all the artifacts we need to interact with that library, such as layout, method handles, and var handles. Before we look at JStruct in any more details, let's take a step back instead and look at how we would use JNI to call a function like QSort. QSort is a function in the standard C library which sorts array elements using a custom comparator function. In this example, to spice things up, we want to use JNI to invoke QSort and use a comparator function written in Java. To make this all work, we need several artifacts. First, a Java source file, which contains a native method declaration. When this file is compiled by the Java C compiler, another file is generated. The other file contains a native function declaration. We then have to define an implementation for this function in either C or C++. In this case, we have to use a bunch of JNI functions to retrieve a pointer to the Java comparator method so that we can then pass it to the QSort function. Then we have to compile the C file and produce a shared library which is then linked to the JVM. It is easy to see why writing a piece of JNI code like this is no fun. There are many artifacts here, all of which have to be in sync for the JVM to be able to link a Java native method declaration to its corresponding C implementation. None of the dance is necessary with Panama. The only thing we need to do here is to point JStruct at the header file for the C standard library, and JStruct will generate all the code that we need to call the QSort native function. Here we can see that JStruct has generated a class that contains several static declarations. One such declaration is the QSort function itself. Another is a static factory that is very handy, as it allows us to turn a Java Lambda expression into a function pointer that we can then pass to the QSort function as our custom comparator function. With extract, there is no need to create method handles and layouts manually. Everything is mechanically derived from the library header files. And if we look inside the bindings generated by JExtract, we will find no surprises, just memory layouts and method handles. In fact, the static methods for the QSort function itself is just a thin wrapper around the method handle invocation. This is handy because manipulating method handles directly can be quite sharp. Not only Panama is a lot easier to write than JNI, but it also performs a lot better than JNI. This chart compares the execution time of a QSort call between Panama and JNI. As we can see, the Panama QSort version, despite being much easier to write, is almost three times faster than its Java counterpart. Now that we have the extract, let's turn back to TensorFlow. The TensorFlow C API has an header file, so we can simply point the extract to that header file and generate a bunch of Panama binding for the TensorFlow API. Indeed, JStruct will generate a C underscore API class, which contains various static methods, one for each of the functions in the TensorFlow C API. In this case, we just import all the static symbols in the class and then invoke the function, which returns the version of the TensorFlow library that we have installed on our system. And as the TensorFlow library is updated, the only thing that we need to do is to rerun the JStruct tool again and regenerate all the bindings. In other words, JStruct removes all the maintenance burden that is typically associated with JNI bindings. In this talk, we have seen how Project Panama provides the foundation to a better native interoperability story. First, Project Panama provides a brand new API for allocating and accessing of it memory in a way that is safe and efficient. This API overcomes many of the limitations typically associated with the byte buffer API by providing a programming model that is centered around the idea of safe and timely deallocation. Second, 
Project Panama replaces JNI with a new low-level API, which allows us to describe and link native functions as method handles. These method handles can be created and invoked in plain Java code without the need of any intervening C or C++ code. And last, Project Panama introduces a new tool, JStruct, which brings these two API together by allowing to mechanically derive Java bindings from native library headers. The foreign function and memory API is an incubating API in Java 18. This has really been a community effort, and I'm pleased to say that to date we had some very successful real-world validation of the Panama API. Projects of the light of Apache, Lucene, Netty, and Tomcat, they all created experimental branches where they tried to replace their usage of by buffer and JNI with the new Panama API. The JSRC tool is itself not part of JEP 419 and will likely be delivered as a separate artifact. That said, the JSRC tool can still be obtained by downloading the Panama Early Access binary. There is a link in the slide. And the bindings generated by JSRC can then be compiled and executed on a vanilla JDK 18 distribution. So after all we've seen in this session, do you think it is finally time to say goodbye to Jay and I? Well, why don't you try Panama out and tell us what you think? If you want to play with the Panama API, or if you are curious about it and want to learn more, Java 18 is only one download away. Thank you for listening to the session. Take care and I'll see you around.